Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Judy. I'm an alcoholic, and I just feel so honored to be in such an amazing international meeting of people who I know are committed to working the 12 steps of the program. And I I, I wanted to uh, uh, select the theme of being involved because to me, uh, the action of working the steps of the program and taking suggestions from people that are in meetings and following uh, spiritual principles in my life all really have to do with being involved. Um, I am going to tell you a a little bit about my uh, tragically traumatic childhood (laughs) and true and a little bit about my drinking, but most of my life now I've been sober. So I really want to focus a lot on how the program has transformed my life. And uh, I went from a scared, traumatized little girl uh, to an out-of-control drinker and fell into the arms of Alcoholics Anonymous that gave me a life. And I I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I've been sober since... um, uh, July 13th, 1977. It took me about a year to really get it, um, admit I was an alcoholic and to really get serious about being involved in my own sobriety. So I'm trying to like put that theme in. Anyway, um, I grew up in Minnesota and uh, it's very cold there and Most everybody in our neighborhood and everybody I knew is either Norwegian, Swedish, or Danish. And um, nobody ever in that culture talks about feelings. And everybody just presents uh, an outside image of what they want other people to think their lives are like. And uh, then you just suck it up if something bad happens. And uh, my uh, my mom, my poor mom, was uh, bipolar schizophrenic. And I didn't find out until about two years ago that there was no effective medication for uh, this predicament until years after she was dead. They didn't start using um, lithium or anything that would stabilize uh, people with this malady. Uh, during the during her lifetime, and I want you to know that I keep learning all the time in my sobriety, and I, in my belief of my remembered childhood, had it in my mind that if my I, what my father used to say, if she would just do what the doctor said, if she would just follow the directions, if she would do this, if she would do that, she'd be okay. And when I uh, discovered that there wasn't any real help, and just from uh, 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 reading a book I came across a couple of years ago, I just changed and softened a lot toward my feelings about my mom and the things that went down. Uh, My brother was also bipolar schizophrenic, and both of them had uh, an unusual symptom of of violence uh with it and so she was very she was dangerous my brother was dangerous and uh there were attempts on um my life and my brother's life from my mother and i just walked around scared all the time i never uh the minute i walked in the door I just didn't know what was going to happen. And sometimes my mom would be sort of normal and there'd be chocolate chip cookies and milk on the table. And, you know, sometimes uh, 
She'd be throwing things. I just, I, sometimes I would get slapped. I just never knew what was going to happen. And an uh, interesting thing to me is I used to speak at sometimes, you know, not, I'm not a big speaker, but uh, I'd speak my at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and I'd share about my mother. And people would come up to me after the meeting and say, my mother was alcoholic too. And so I suspect that my mother had symptoms or the feelings of growing up with this kind of a mother might be similar to and people growing up with an alcoholic mother. In any case, it was a great relief to me as a, a teenager to find alcohol. I finally, I you know, just like growing up, I just kind of like was overweight and I didn't, I felt like a blob. I just didn't feel like, I, I, I was sort of ignored in my family because the focus was always on my mother and all the things that were going on. But I just, um, drinking just gave me relief from this feeling. And I became a really uh, interesting drinker in, you know, like, life of the party sort of thing. And uh, it just uh, started at a really young age. And I had no idea that uh, my drinking was any different from anybody else's. And uh, when I was, um, when I graduated from high school, it had been in my mind, since my mother tried to, um, kill my brother and me, which was when I was about 14. I had it in my mind because uh, after this happened, my dad, I mean, like right away after this happened, my dad said, don't, we don't ever talk about this again. I don't ever want you to hear a word about this. And I just thought, like, this wall came around me, and I just thought, "There's, I'm out of here. I'm just, uh, the minute I get a chance, I am out of here. No one is going to help me. No one's going to protect me. I'm on my own. I have actually a, a journal from 1963 where I have in my own handwriting I can't trust anybody or anything. The only one that's ever going to help me is me. And, you know, like that's a real uh, recipe of thinking that is a disaster. And uh, so I left Minnesota when I was like about two weeks after graduation, I was in California. And I think some of the things that were meant to be in my life have happened because it was the right path for me. I don't know. But I found a job and I started a university and uh, found a room to rent near the college I was going to within uh, 10 days. I have, I have to go look at my journal to see all this stuff, to believe it myself. And uh, everything uh, you know, to me, I had run away from this family and everything was going to be fine because I was away from them. And I then started drinking uh, really seriously. And I still went to school, but I was doing a lot of partying. And uh, after, uh, I, you know, to disguise my drinking, I was a functional alcoholic. I kept working harder, thinking, okay, if I get another college degree, if I get a better job, if I get a better promotion, uh, it just shows that I'm okay, and I'm going to get the respect I deserve. I always thought I never got the respect I deserved, and I probably didn't, <laughs> but uh, nobody actually does. So after uh, an some years of drinking in my 20s, I ended up um, 
getting a, a really good job in an aerospace company, and I got assigned to work with this person name of Frank Priest, and we were assigned to write. I, I've been a writer in my career. We were assigned to write a whole bunch of like technology brochures. And so I'm sharing a cubicle with him. And I find out in a, within a couple of months, um, somebody in the department invited me to go to an AA meeting. And I'd been drinking at lunch and uh, that sort of thing. Anyway, I went to the AA meeting and Frank was there. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to wonder why I'm here. And anyway, from that point on, Frank and I would do our work. And then we would talk about AA. And he would talk to me about the steps. And he kept telling me I had to do this. And I'd tell him about these terrible resentments I had. And he he would say, well, I had to write out these things and talk to me about this fourth step. And he starts drawing these columns. And I didn't get it that I was supposed to be, that he was suggesting that maybe I might want to do this myself. A side note is, because it's Lois's birthday, Lois Wilson. Um, I was uh, sorting through my closet the other day, and I found a picture of Frank and his wife, Francie, with Lois. So he he died um, in the 90s, but he, he had been sober. When I met him, he was sober uh, 28 years. He died at 45, 45 years sober. And uh, it just, for him, he met Bill Wilson, he met Lois. And so I feel like I have uh, been close to uh, people that have been no actually knowing the founders. And I remember in, in the the beginning of my sobriety, um, I remember getting drunk a few times and uh I it, some of them happened at work and I remember one time waking up from a black up sitting across uh at the table at a coffee shop with Frank and I remember he said he I was drinking coffee and he said well now I have a wide awake drunk on my hands and he said to me uh Judy the th I said, I have no idea how this happened. I didn't intend to drink, and I don't, you know, I didn't, I didn't get it. And he said, and this is part of this theme of being involved. He said, well, Judy, you see, the thing is, people that really get this program, they put it before everything else in their life. And my God, I remember that message that that's a message from 45 years ago and that's really about being involved and another person said to me act as if you care enough about yourself to stay sober and to work the program and those things have stayed with me and been so important to me uh I remember somebody once said that um, Bill Wilson said that only a small percentage of alcoholics, keep, he said a small percentage of alcoholics keep the rest of the people sober. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought, I want to be in that percentage. I want to be one of those people. I want to be really into this. and. Everything that's really been fabulous in my life has started a baby step at a time where I didn't even ask for it or want it. I just stick, stuck my toe in the water and and things happened. And I started going to AA meetings on my lunch hour at work with Frank, and um, I didn't share for about a year. 
I was still, I, and I thought to myself, these people are so happy. Um, they couldn't possibly know the pain I'm in. And I thought to myself, I have to be the most fearful person in this entire room. I I had those thoughts running through my head all the time. And, and I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous what an alcoholic was, that once I have a certain amount of alcohol in my body, I can't stop drinking and bad things happen. And I thought they just happened. I didn't take any responsibility for them. And when I finally, uh, Frank encouraged me to get a female sponsor. And I, when I finally really got the message that I had to really get involved with my own sobriety, that I thought that, you know, because I have this journal from 1963 and pages and notebooks and I've got notebooks of writing and everything all the time. Well, to me, that meant I had worked the fourth step because I had done all this journaling and I didn't feel I needed a sponsor. I felt like I was, I'd looked at the steps and I thought, yeah, yeah, I've made apologies to people. I've sometimes I've said I'm wrong, you know, I, I I've said some prayers, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I got them all covered. And it, it, it wasn't, you know, it's kind of like I wanted to look at it like getting my Girl Scout badges and ju justifying and rationalizing that I'd already worked the steps. And it wasn't until I worked the steps under the guidance of a sponsor and following the simple program in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I was able to stay sober. And I've stayed sober so far f doing exactly that. I do exactly today what I did as a newcomer. And my first sponsor, um, Gwen Sullivan, said to me, um, "You, we work all of the problems in our life like we work the problem with alcohol, we start by saying we're powerless over alcohol and that our lives are unmanageable. And she said, well, your life, you know, looks pretty good because I was functional in my career. Uh, she said, how about saying, I admit I'm powerless over this situation and my feelings are unmanageable. And that worked really well for me. These suggestions that people made for me have have helped me to make this program my own and so she used to have me i used to have all these people against me all the time at work and i mean work is a really toxic nasty environment and if any of you are 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 still working i don't ever want to forget how hard it was to be in the corporate world and so there were actually people that were kind of like uh, doing things behind my back to try and uh, undermine what I was doing at work. And she used to have me write out on a piece of paper. One of the guy's name was Dave. So I'd write on the paper, I admit I'm powerless over Dave and it makes my feelings unmanageable. I believe a power greater than myself can restore me to soundness of mind in this situation. And I turn this over to a power greater than myself. So she, she made me write it out and put the paper in my pocket. And she said, so whenever you think of Dave, I want you to touch that piece of paper. And if it doesn't, thought doesn't leave you, open that paper up and read it to yourself. So she started me on practices that in, that involved me being involved. It wasn't just giving lip service to the principles of the program or stating, saying the third step prayer or something like that. It involved me actually putting it into really concrete effort in my life. And she was really bossy, really bossy. And 
I just did what she said. And uh, she sponsored, she sponsored me for about seven years and uh, she passed away. But I was, you know, then later to choose sponsors that were more caring and more loving and less punitive. You know, if I called her and said I had a problem, she'd say, how did you put yourself in a position to be hurt? And I needed that at a certain time in my sobriety. And then there was a time when I was doing these things and I didn't need to um, kind of have somebody be punishing in their tone to me. So I've been through a lot of experiences with um, in my growth. Uh, I've sometimes needed a different type of person or a different type of treatment or something. And whenever I've asked for help from my higher power, when I say I'm powerless and I want help, I also pray that I be receptive to the answers that come up in front of me. And being receptive has really been an important part of my sobriety that it isn't just, it isn't me uh, that's going to solve my problems. I need to be receptive to the answers that are going to come within me and from outside me. I need to be open to learning and listening and to getting help. And I just told a, a sponsee the other day that she should write out a list of all the things, the stressful issues that are seem unsolvable to her, write out the list of them. And and be willing to get help for them. And then I remembered this morning, because I woke up obsessed by some unresolved issues in my life that are fairly trivial, actually. But I still, that doesn't cause me not to obsess about them. And I remember what my sponsor, Gwen Sullivan, said. She said, listen to the advice you give other people and then follow it yourself. So I wrote on the paper, I am willing, I am willing to get help and be receptive to the answers for these issues. And I wrote down about four things. And um, actually, I resolved two of them on the internet before I even had my second cup of coffee. And I'm learning that I don't have to be alone in the world and solve all my own issues. That every time something has happened in my life. Somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous or somebody from outside of Alcoholics Anonymous has been there to help me. There's, I, I've had some very difficult situations in my family. And out of the woodwork comes somebody on the program who went through the same thing. And I just feel so blessed that I have exposure to this community of people who are working the 12 steps of the program. And um, I, you know, like I want to say that I am a, a, you know, like a tea bag meditator. I only meditate when I'm in hot water. And I want to share that uh, once one of the worst things that can happen to me is like what I used to do is um, some of my writing stuff. I start teaching writing at companies and at little uh, like for the city of Redondo Beach or the city of Torrance, the little communities, you know, like the employees would take my little courses. And I got a bad criticism in one of the courses. And it was from the assistant city manager of, of Torrance that was taking the course. And the next time I, uh, the next day that I came in, they were going to observe me all day. And I was so humiliated. I just felt like I was, this was like, I mean, this is not even like cancer or heart attack, but I'm feeling like this is a problem on that level. And I thought, I can't show up. I can't do it. I can't go there anymore. I can't do this. I can't face this. They don't want me. They're, you know, they don't trust me. So I uh, 
sat on the floor and turned the lights off and just sat on the floor and, you know, maybe I don't know how long I was there. And I thought, well, this isn't working. And I started to get up and something inside of me said, forget yourself. And I thought, oh, my God, that is the key. I am completely self-obsessed. And so when I went in the next day, I said a prayer. I always pray about things when I'm also a teabag prayer, but I always pray about things, and I don't really believe necessarily that there's a, some anthropomorphic God that's listening to Judy Shane's problems and help, you know, but I believe that something happens inside of me that changes me when I do. And I decided I was going to make this training. If it was, you know, if they were going to fire me at the end of the day from this, it was a, it was a big project that was going to give me uh, money for my business for the rest of the year. So if I was going to be fired, that's fine. But I was going to make this training about the people that were sitting there. And I said to myself, you know, help me say the things that people need to hear. Help, help me, guide me to say, and I, I don't know, you know, like exactly what I did differently, but I wasn't afraid anymore. And I kept drawing them out and asking them for their ideas. And I was able to take that direction for that I got in meditation, forget yourself. And I thought about that before I was going to share today here at this meeting, because I haven't ever shared more than three or five minutes in a Zoom meeting. And it's... Um, not a comfortable thing for me. I don't even know, you know, like how long 45 minutes is to share and all this stuff. And I thought, Judy, just forget yourself. You know, you, um, you've had experience staying sober. You've had experience working the 12 steps. You know, let the words come to you. And my sponsor, Gwen Sullivan, used to always say when I was in a situation that was scary for me to say, God, go before me and give me the words and to not just charge in and, and try and, you know, change, do what, you know, what my person, try to rise above my personality. And I was thinking about this subject of being involved it sounds like, oh, that's something you should do, right? Get involved, be invo being involved. Yeah, being involved, that's good. Well, my experience is um, being involved brings out the worst in me, and being involved brings out the best in me. And it depends on what my spiritual condition is, is how successful I am at being involved. And what I feel so certain of is that when I screw up, the program allows me to make amends. And um, Frank Priest, really the the person that I feel like handed me sobriety on a silver platter, by you know it was God, you know, putting him in my life. I think um, he used to say, "Don't worry, Judy. God works through your character defects too. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect." And uh, so to me, being involved means doing whatever it takes in terms of the steps of the program to be fully engaged in the moment. And whether I screw up in the way I'm involved or not, it both the positive and the negatives of being involved have to do with being fully engaged in the moment. And right now in my sobriety, um, I'm still doing, I'm 77 years old. <laughs> I'm still, um, I, I'm still, 
doing work. I'm, I do the communications for my cousin's uh, charity. She has a school in uh, Tanzania. That, and so I do the website writing and the, all that kind of stuff. So I'm doing things that are that I'm fully engaged in. And I feel like I'm living a rich, full life um, and engaged in everything I'm doing besides being involved. You know, I, I'm just having a lot of fun. And part of it is I have these three um, women that I swim in the ocean with Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And they're not on the program. They don't have a 12 step program. They, I don't know, you know, uh, I don't have really deep relationships with them. But they're showing me about what friendship looks like, that consistency. They show up almost no matter what, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 a.m. We're at the ocean. We're ready to dive in. And they. Um, I just feel like what Frank said to me in the early days when I didn't have any friends. And I just hung around people that were his age. I didn't have people that were friends my own age. He said, Judy, you will create the fellowship you crave. And um, so this has happened in my life, one baby step at a time. And uh, on the days I don't uh, swim, I hike with these, with a pretty large group of people. And some of them are on the program. And then when we travel, um, by the way, I lived in New Zealand from um, 89. I was in New Zealand 89 to 98. And I'm a New Zealand citizen. I have dual citizenship. And um, so somebody who I heard in a, somebody I heard in a meeting said alcoholics, this was an AA meeting. Alcoholics don't know how to say take yes for an answer. And it, um, somebody in the hiking group said, I was, I was saying, I don't have the money to go back to New Zealand and I miss my friends and I miss the country and I don't, you know, and she said, you should become a hiking leader and you can take a group to New Zealand and then, and your way will be paid for. And this is the, our, the hiking group that I'm involved in. And I said, oh no, I'd never do that. Well, I couldn't sleep that night. Oh, it, when somebody makes a suggestion to me, I automatically say, no, 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 I, no, 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 no. I know, I know that I can't do that. And so anyway, I, she made that suggestion and she said, I know somebody that will help you get your leadership qualifications and be happy to lead a trip to New Zealand with you. Anyway, so I d called her the next day and we set everything in motion and the, her, the first hike I led that was not a provisional hike well, where I'm trying to get my leadership qualifications was in New Zealand. And I've um, over the years I've been back, I've led nine trips to New Zealand. So my friends in America have met my friends in New Zealand. And Heather, who's Renee's mother, if you to break everyone's anonymity and everything, cross talking like crazy. Um, she's been a part of these New Zealand trips. And it's been such a joy for me to combine these two, you know, my friends in the north in the northern hemisphere and my friends in the southern hemisphere. And all of these things have just been gifts to me that have been results of me doing the footwork. I also heard in AA meetings that 98% of everything is just showing up. And for me to, to, to show up, be present, and say yes to people's suggestions, you know, think things through. I usually do still do say no on everything. And then I make myself think it through. And uh, it's really transformed my life. And so the same group of people started saying to me, well, you should go other places too. So actually, um, I took a group to Italy. We were hiking in the Dolomites a year ago in October. And uh, 
that's why I was so excited to see the woman here from from Italy. And um, I just feel like I have been so overpaid by being a member of this program that I have people who care about me, or I feel they do. But more important, I have people that I care about. And I, I've learned on this program that the only love that I really get to experience is the love that comes from my heart to yours. I always came to this program thinking, oh, if my parents didn't love me, my family didn't love me, my boyfriends didn't love me, my husband's plural didn't love me. I'm never loved. I'm unlovable, blah, blah, blah. And then it finally occurred to me, you know, maybe people that I even think love me don't. <laughs> the only real love I get to feel is what I feel for you. And as I keep working this program, and I have a sponsor, I work the steps with a sponsor. And as I keep working the program, I just feel spontaneous love for the people around me. And it's much less important what people think of me than, you know, like what I f feel for them. And uh, I'm not tuned into WIF, WIIFM so much anymore, what's in it for me. I have times when I actually do have the ability to forget myself, but I have to keep doing the work all the time. It doesn't just happen that I wake up and have, uh, you know, like uh, some sort of miracle good feelings. It just it is involved with me staying really active in the program. And it is just as when I was new, the most important thing in my life is my program. And my home group is the Hermosa Beach 6.45 a.m group and the people that are in the room from America that they go to my um 6 45 a.m meeting and it on the weekends it's at 7 a.m and my home group in New Zealand was as Bill sees at 9 a.m on Saturdays in Epson and I loved that meeting and uh so I just want to say that um, the greatest experience that I can have is, you know, like all this exterior stuff I do, like the ocean swimming and the hiking and the traveling and everything. All these things with time are all going to go away because I won't be able to continue doing that for my entire lifetime. But the feelings that I have of being useful in Alcoholics Anonymous and the feelings I have sitting in a meeting and listen to people share their feelings and tell the truth about their lives and share the struggles they have in, in growing and the ability I, that and the willingness that I have to share the same when I'm uh, when it's my turn in the barrel. I get to I get to come in and get the care that I need. That's something that can never be taken away. And the people like Gwen Sullivan and Frank Priest that have saved my life over and over and over, who have both been dead for more than twenty years, um, they are have never been taken away from me. They're still in my heart, and I still hear their words. And I still follow their direction. And I still am in the process of fulfilling their predictions for me. And so anyway, I'm going to close. And I just want to thank you for listening to me. And I love looking at your your beautiful faces. And um, that's, all, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.